Uh, so let's get into it. So RS-232 gets its name recommended standard. And uh, before there was the standardization boards, that's what they used to use as RS. For example, NTSC, which is analog television is RS-170, uh, but RS-232 came after that. Uh, it's also known as EIA-232. Uh, uh, so when RS-232 was developed, it was developed uh, for me, communications between data terminal equipment and data uh, communications equipment, or what some people call data circuit equipment. Uh, we sometimes know of that equipment as, uh, it's called a modem, a modulator, demodulator, right? So, uh, you know, this was either typically done over leased lines or over telephone lines, right? But they had to find a way to get data terminal equipment to chat with these, these modems. Uh, one common misconception is that everyone calls the connector a DB9, but there's no such thing. It's called a DE9, right? Uh, and I've included a picture of uh, the two types of uh, connectors, which are very common, the nine pin and the 25 pin. So, Back in 1963, if you wanted to communicate with a mainframe or a mini computer, this is what your equipment looked like. Your data terminal equipment was on the left and your data communications equipment was on the right. Um, the ASR33 was a very common teletype that people would use to communicate with computers. Uh, it only ran at 110 baud or 10 characters per second. Uh, and I'll get exactly what the baud rate is and, and later on, but uh, 10 characters per second was all you got because of mechanical limitations of, you know, what that uh, equipment was capable of. And it was purely electromechanical. There were absolutely no electronics in it whatsoever outside of the rectifier circuits. It was all mechanical and electromechanical. Um, data communications equipment used something called Bell 103A, which was a standard that uh, the Bell Telephone Company used to communicate to other modems. And it was only 300 baud or 30 characters per second. Um, it used standard frequency shift keying over regular ordinary telephone lines. And of course, uh, like anything Bell, they prohibited you from connecting anything up to the telephone network unless you, unless you rented it. So this was equipment that the telephone company would provide you with, and you'd pay them a rental fee to be able to use that equipment. People got around that by using these things called acoustic couplers. Acoustic coupler did not have any electrical connection to the telephone network, and that's how people got around it. So your typical DTE to DTE connection was your mainframe mini computer went to a modem or a data set or DCE, right? Through the public switch telephone network or what they call POTS Plano telephone network over through to another DCE, then over to your DTE. So not that long ago, it was very common for one side of your connection to be a mainframe or mini computer and the other one to be you know, uh, teletype or a personal computer. Um, and so I talk about a bit, you know, why people use these acoustic couplers. Um, but this is typically how you would connect up two computers over the public switch telephone network. And RS-232 had a lot to play in that. Um, so why would we use RS-232 in the shack? Because I'm sure none of us have, you know, teletypes in the shack, but if we do, all the more power to you. Uh, well, we use them for HF radios, for what they call computer-aided transceiver, for remote control. Um, you know, we were talking about, the Jerry was talking about that earlier, where the radio can uh, send information such as your mode, your frequency, you can control a push to talk, and you can read your VFO frequency or even change your VFO frequency. Uh, logging programs, where logging programs can, uh, you know, uh, interface with your computer and then use that to read the CAT control. Uh, digital mode software can tell the radio when to use uh, push to talk. Um, 
you have your antenna switching and rotor control. So many antenna switches and antenna rotors have the ability to accept RS-232 uh, information and then interpret that and then do things with it, like uh, rotate your antenna 90 degrees or, or whatever. Uh, mostly just for remote operation. Comes in handy though for other such things. Um, uh, some linear amplifiers, antenna tuners also use RS-232 for uh, band switching. So if you set your linear amplifier to 40 meters, while well, your antenna switch goes, oh, I'm on 40 meters, so it, it switches, or your radio communicates to your linear amp or whatever. And then one uh, big thing, and I'm going to touch on this a little bit later, is the, is the terminal node controller, or TNC, which is something that we would use as a modem of sorts to communicate over the air to other radios. So prior to 1984, uh, all microprocessor controlled radios, such as the ICOM IC701, needed special interfacing circuitry between the computer and the radio's microprocessor. Uh, there really was no standard defined before then, and remote control was challenging to do. Um, a good example of that is the IC701 uh, CPU did not have any buffering. Uh, it needed a lot of glue logic to make things work. And it was TTL level, which was zero and five volts. So just, you know, hooking up an RS-232 port to the, to the radio was unthinkable unless you really knew what you were doing. Um, CAT, when it came out, the computer-aided transceiver standard standardized how you connected up a transceiver uh, to a computer. And of course, uh, one advantage of RS-232 as well is that by using something like an optocoupler, you can have a, a very simple PTT circuit so that when we drive one of the um, pins low, um, we can engage PTT on the radio uh, with a very simple amount of interfacing circuitry, right? So for older radios, how do we interface them? We needed a special proprietary level converter, which some hams actually homebrewed. Uh, Yesu radios use the FIF-232C. ICOM radios use a CT17 CIV converter, and uh, Kenwood's use an IF232C. Um, the idea behind these boxes is that it drives the, the higher RS-232 voltages into something the radio can understand and use. Um, now, this is only really applicable to older older radios, 1980s and some 1990s era radios all needed these converters. Uh, most notably, the FT-1000D need one of these. ICOM CIV system got around a lot of the limitations of RS-232 in that the problem with RS-232 is you can only have one radio per port or one device per port. And so what they did is they decided, well, first of all, I wanna be able to drive multiple radios or multiple de ICOM devices off of one single RS-232 port. And the way you interfaced between the level converter and the radio was just a simple standard stereo eight inch uh, audio cable between the level converter and the radio. No special hardware required, no special cables required. You needed an RS-232 cable from the level converter to the computer and then from there that stereo cable to go between the radio and the CIV uh, converter. Um, it was such a, a fantastic standard when ICOM released this that they still support CIV even today. Uh, for example, my IC9700, which is a relatively new radio, it still supports CIV. Um, even after all these years. Um, 
I talk about as well, uh, 2000s vintage radios. They finally decided that level converters, uh, you know, weren't necessary anymore. And they put a real RS-232 port on the back of the radio so that you could just plug the computer straight into the radio without needing any kind of interface. Um, unless we're talking about a ICOM radio, which you, that they actually have a CIV jack on the back of the radio. So, uh, a few great things about RS-232 is it's very simple to interface two different devices together. Uh, at minimum, you need three wires. Uh, when I say chewing gum and bailing wire, because RS-232 was designed to work at slow speeds, uh, you can get away with anything. You can take some 22 gauge wire and stick it into the holes of the connector and run it across the room if you want, and it, it will work, right? Um, and of course, uh, one thing I do mention here is that RS-232 was built, um, or sorry, it was designed in such a way where it was designed to run in environments with high noise, uh, high electrical noise. So, proper RS-232 cables are shielded from connector to connector, right? Uh, so they were designed for that right out of, right out of the box. Um, and of course, one other advantage about RS-232 is that you can run cables up to 50 feet long uh, without any amplifiers, without any repeaters. Uh, and if you decide to use something like an ethernet to RS-232 converter, uh, you can extend that not only to the 50 feet, but also to the maximum length of what Ethernet can do. So potentially up to 428 feet. Um, the other advantage about RS-232 is that if you make a mistake assembling a cable yourself, the cables are very tolerant to making mistakes. The connectors are easy to solder on, right? If you get the, the metal too hot and you start melting the plastic, you can always bend the pin back back where it's supposed to be. Um, now the caveat, the very first point I thought I might want to mention is uh, when I say three wires at minimum, this depends on the interfacing hardware of the, of the DTE, uh, right, of the data terminal equipment. So what's not so great about it? Well, uh, the first problem is, is that the data rates aren't very high. Uh, the maximum baud rate, and when I mean baud rate is the um, the speed of the interface um, is 115,200 uh, bits per second, right? Um, older devices prior to 1988 can only do 9,600 uh, baud, right? Um, now, in saying that, there are newer RS-232 devices that can go all the way up to 961,600 baud, which is better. Uh, but compared to other standards, it's quite slow. Good enough for text, though. Um, the other problem is, is that most modern computers today don't have any physical RS-232 ports unless you add in an add-on card, right? Um, and those add-on cards are typically, you know, just two ports and that's all you get. Um, another problem is, is that RS-232 to USB adapter cables um, can be a little bit dicey to use. Uh, a good example of that was when the prolific PL2303 chipset was discontinued underneath Windows 10, and anybody that had one of these older cables uh, faced a problem or would just stop working because the drivers were unavailable for it. Um, now, uh, for those that know what a null modem is, uh, and I'm sure some of you know what this is, uh, not all RS-232 cables can be trusted. And what I mean by that is, um, is it wired properly? Is it wired one-to-one? -one? Is it not wired as a null modem? And I'll get into that in a bit. Is it unshielded? Does it have all the conductors? You don't know until you test it, right? Uh, I've, in my career, uh, had something trying to get two devices to work together and they would not work no matter what I tried. And then I swapped out the cable and then it just started working. I'm like, well, what was that all about? Um, so the other issue is, is that it's all manual configuration. There's absolutely no automatic 
configuration at all. You have to manually configure both the DCE and the DTE to get them to talk to each other, uh, with the exception of Autobot, which I'll get into in a bit. Um, and of course, I mentioned this before, uh, you have a one-to-one -one device to port, right? You can have one modem per RS-232 port, unless, of course, this is ICOM CIV system. Um, so a little bit about the logic levels of RS-232. The receive voltages are actually quite liberal, right? Um, plus 25, minus 25 volts. However, uh, most computers will always use uh, minus 12 and plus 12 volts because that's what the power supplies are designed for. Um, the logic levels on RS-232 are reversed. So a logic zero, right, is 15 volts and a logic one is minus 15 volts or it can be minus 12 and plus 12, but you kind of have to imagine it's flipped right? It's inverted. And all uh, RS-232 converters is per the diagram here, um, have inverters from the TTL inputs to the RS-232 outputs and vice versa. So it can work with TTL logic levels, but Unfortunately, sometimes it can be a bit noisy and it might not always work, right? Uh, if you notice here on the transmitter side, the plus five volts and the minus five volts is just at the threshold of what is acceptable for RS-232. But typically you'll always find those plus 12 and minus 12 voltage levels. Um, now for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to use the words assert and de-assert because saying high and low can confuse people. And when I mean assert, I mean the minus 12 volt or a logic one, right? Um, now, the other thing I thought I might wanna to mention too is that a lot of these USB to RS-232 adapter cables only really connect up the, the data pins, but not the control lines. And I'll get into what those are later. Um, but uh, something like CIV, for example, uses something called a MAX-232 chip. And a MAX-232 chip is something that will always take um, RS-232 logic levels and convert them down to TTL levels and the proper TTL uh, um, logic levels. You'll also find these on things like Raspberry Pi hats and that kind of thing. It's kind of a, you know, one off for all kinds of RS-232 interfacing. Um, and of course, you know, the uncertainty zone, plus three, minus three volts, that's where the chips start guessing as to what the logic level can be. And when you're in that part of the zone, that's when you start getting lots of noise and garbage characters and that kind of thing. Um, so the pinout, uh, we're only going to talk about nine pin RS-232 because that's what's relevant today. There is 25 pin RS-232, but a lot of the pins that it uses is, are completely irrelevant and are mostly obsolete. Uh, they're very seldom used. Uh, so nine pins are what we use. <clears throat> so in the next slide here, I'm just going to flip back and forth between these two slides. I talk about what all of these signals are for and how they work and what uh, you would use them for. But I'll stay on this diagram so that I can work through this. So in this particular situation, in this diagram here, we see a DTE to DCE connection, which is one to one. So pin one is wired to pin one, pin two is wired to pin two, and so on and so forth. This is a one-to-one -one cable, and this is from DTE to DCE. That's incredibly easy to wire one of these up. Um, so the first pin is what we call data carrier detect. Uh, 
And data carrier detect is largely obsolete, but back in the days when modems weren't very smart, they needed a way of being able to communicate back to the DTE and saying, hey, I can hear another modem on the other end of the telephone line. So I detect a carrier and that pin would then assert, right? Um, that always comes from the modem or the DCE to the DTE to tell it that, hey, I got a connection. Uh, from there, the next two pins are receive data and transmit data. Um, should be fairly self-explanatory, but this is two of the three pins I mentioned that you need as a bare minimum for a connection to work, right? The next uh, pin is what's called data terminal ready. Data terminal ready is something that the DTE sends the DT DCE to say to the DCE, I'm here and I'm willing to accept uh, stuff from you. It's a way of the DCE being able to say, okay, I see a terminal on the other side and I can take calls if I were set to auto answer, right? Um, number five is signal ground. And this is not to be confused with shield ground. If you notice on the connector on the left, you'll notice that the, sh that the whole entire um, connector uh, is metal on the outside with a metal ring that's kind of shaped a bit like a D, right? That's the, sh that's the shield ground. Don't ever confuse signal ground with shield ground because they're two different grounds, okay? Um, the signal ground is the third pin as a minimum that you need for things to work. So receive data, transmit data, and signal ground are bare minimums. Uh, data set ready comes from the DCE back to the DTE, and it's a way for the modem, and I keep saying modem because that's, that's what a DCE typically would be. It's a way for the modem to tell the data terminal, okay, I'm here, I'm ready. So DTR, data terminal ready, and data set ready are the two pins that the data terminal and the modem use to communicate with each other to say, hey, I'm here. And that's all it's for. Now, when I talked earlier about uh, the minimum of three pins, there is a hard AND gate in many uh, RS-232 interfaces where you need a DTE to DCE pin that goes from data terminal ready to data set ready. And I'll get into no modem cables in a bit. But without data terminal ready being high or asserted, right? And without data set ready being asserted, right? Uh, it doesn't matter how much data that you put across the receive and transmit pins, nothing will go across if the, if the hardware is set up that way, right? Um, it's there as a check to make sure that the equipment is there and ready, right? Uh, then we have um, uh, the request to send and clear to send pins. Uh, request to send goes from the DTE to the DCE. And it basically says, okay, um, I have data to send you and I am ready to send you data. And the CTS comes from the modem back to the terminal and the, and the modem says, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, clear to, I'm clear to send data to you. Right, so those are what's called handshaking pins, and I'm going to get into that in just a bit. But um, the way things used to work, and it used to be a real problem, is that when I talked to you earlier about the teletype versus the modem, right? The modem it you know received and transmitted data at 30 characters per second, and the teletype could only do 10. Right, so how does the teletype say, whoa, 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 hang on, hang on, I can't handle this much data? Wait, wait, hang up. Well, it doesn't say hang up, it says hold up, excuse me. Well, it uses these uh, RTS and CTS pins to say to the, to the modem, I'm not ready to take data right now. Wait until I finish printing out my characters and then you can go. And if uh, we were at the opposite end where the data terminal was much faster than the modem, which became a problem in the 1990s, the modem would say, yeah, you're not clear to send me any data because I, I can't take that much data from you. So it's a way of making sure that there's regulation between the two devices, right? Um, 
the next pin isn't used much anymore and that's ring indicator when we talk about modems that were you know um stupid and were very simple when the phone rang it this pin would assert right and what would happen is is that uh this would then you know ring a bell on the on the terminal or something and then the operator could push a button and pick up the phone and whatever or the modem would be smart enough to know to pick up the phone automatically and answer the call and take take the establish the data connection uh this is largely obsolete now and nothing really uses it anymore so in this slide, I just talk about what each pin does, why it's there, and what it's for. Um, and I talk about, you know, the, the reason why those pins have to be there. Um, and this is when I'm talking about hardware flow control, when all the flow control is actually done in hardware. Um, so... When I talk about the hard AND for the DTR and D DSR, data terminal ready, data set ready, in USB to RS-232 adapter cables, uh, in some cases, these lines aren't even connected. And what I mean by that is that they're always asserted, no matter what. It, all it's looking for is the transmit and receive data. Again, it depends on the manufacturer of the of the cable, who made it, and what standards they decided to to go upon. So they may or may not be connected. Um, when I talk about the RS-232 to USB adapters. Um, I did a little bit of research because I was kind of curious about this. And from what I understand in the specification, you know, as long as there's a, a pull down resistor, uh, it's not against spec to leave pins floating um, or, or tied to signal ground with a resistor. Um, it's not against the specification to do that. So if you have a cable that's missing pins, it's not a big deal because usually on the on the receiver and transmitter side, there's the necessary resistors in place to make sure there isn't any noise that happens. Um, because of the very nature of how uh, RS-232 has evolved in the shack, the re request to send, clear to send, data terminal ready and data set ready lines um, can be used outside of RS-232 specification. In other words, um, they can be abnormal depending on the software that you're using. A good example of that is um, rig blasters uh, use the RTS line for push to talk, right? Um, and this is why we have to be careful because if you have a rig blaster hooked up and you start up a terminal program, the first thing the terminal program will do is it'll bring, uh, you know, the RTS line high, or sorry, it'll it'll assert it, right? And what will happen? Well, your if you have your radio on, it'll key your radio, and your radio is now stuck on transmit, and you're wondering what the heck is going on? Why is my radio on transmit? And you're you're murmuring to yourself, and you're going, what the heck is going on? And you're transmitting that out over the air without really realizing it. So one thing you have to be careful about is that. If you have, if, if you are using any kind of amateur radio software, uh, don't ever use RTS CTS flow control, and make sure those lines are always set to low, right? Um, because of that, otherwise, and I personally run into this problem myself. So um, now, a null modem cable was when people got sick and tired of uh, having to have all the equipment between their DTEs and DTEs, and they said, you know, there's got to be a better way to do this. So what somebody did is they made a cable that just crossed the connections. So when you want a computer to talk with another computer, you need what's called a null modem cable, which emulates the function of a modem. And you can see in this diagram here that receive data, transmit data is crossed. Data terminal ready and data set ready are crossed. Uh, carrier detect is tied to uh, data set ready. 
an RTS CTS are crossed, right? Um, so if you use a mom, null modem cable between a computer and a modem, right? Uh, in other words, a DTE to a DCE, nothing's gonna happen. You're not gonna get smoke pouring out. Nothing's gonna blow up. Uh, nothing's gonna melt. Just nothing will work. Uh, and you'll be sitting there scratching your head going, why isn't this cable working? Um, so you have to make sure that if you have a null modem in the shack that you label it to make sure that you know it's a null modem and not a straight through serial cable. And I mentioned this in the, in the slide deck as well a few times just to kind of drive it into everybody's heads that null modem cables have caused me no end of grief when I'm troubleshooting something. And I realized, wait a minute, um, you can have uh, adapters that are uh, in the, the picture I showed below, or you can have a null modem cable. Now in this picture, I show that a null modem cable is female to female. Now if spec is being followed and everyone is doing what they're supposed to be doing, a null modem cable should be female to female because a DTE is always usually a male per the slide I showed earlier. In a perfect world, it's not always the case, but that's the way things are supposed to be. Uh, and I, I talk about how DTE equipment's always got male connectors, DCE equipment always always got female connectors, right? Um, null modem cables are female to female. Um, of course, some radios, just to make things exciting, require an old modem cable to work properly. Some don't. Uh, there's an old saying, read the frickin' manual. If you don't know, RTFM, right? Um, and then just to make things even more exciting, sometime you need, sometimes you need gender changers to make things work because the cable that you found that's a null modem cable had the wrong kind of connector on the end of it. So you needed a adapter to go male to male or female to female to make things work. Uh, there's no harm in using adapters at all, just so long as you know that the gender changers that you're using aren't actually null modems themselves, which can make things even more exciting. Um, and of course, I mentioned null modem cables can also be disguised as normal cables. This is why I say always label them so that you know that they are. And you can easily confuse a null modem adapter with a gender changer as per the picture here, because sometimes those labels peel off, right? And then you don't know. <clears throat> so a few caveats here, uh, depending on how, who made the RS-232 cable, uh, they sometimes don't connect shield ground. Uh, now, here in Alberta, we got a company called uh, Circamax that used to be known as Alberta Computer Cable. And they all were always good about making sure that they had the shield ground connected. But sometimes if you look at buying an off-brand cable or something from Amazon or whatever, sometimes they don't do that. Um, you wanna make sure as well that the shield ground is, um, not always tied together with the signal ground. Some cable manufacturers do that. And in some cases, that's not necessarily a problem. Uh, however, uh, if you have lots of noise on your shield ground and your signal ground is tied to it, it can cause all kinds of odd problems to happen, like your computer can lock up, you can end up with garbage on the cable. Uh, and what I mean by garbage on the cable is garbage data going over the cable, right? Um, so uh, it, depending on the manufacturer of the cable, um, if they did their job right, you can use an ohm meter to go shield ground, shield ground, and uh, between shield ground and signal ground, you shouldn't, you should just see like an open. But she, um, signal ground and signal ground should show continuity and shield ground and shield ground should show continuity, just not, you know, them tied together. Uh, now I talked about how 
modem cables are one to one as opposed to a null modem cable. Uh, RS-232 is robust enough to handle shorts, miswired pins. If you screw something up and you wire the cable wrong, you don't get smoke. Um, and it is uh, usually designed so that you don't get excessive current on a pin if you do accidentally short to ground, right? You know, it's just pretty tough. Um, and of course, one big thing I thought I might want to mention is beware of cables with partially wired pinouts. These can and they will bite you if you expect something more than receive data, transmit data, and signal ground. Um, the way you can tell if a, if a cable is partially wired is if it's really thin. If it goes between the DCE and DTE, if it's if it's a very thin cable, um, then yeah, it, it's most likely partially wired. No, it might work just just fine, but it's just something to keep in mind, depending on what you're using that cable with, and what your DTE and your DCE expect from each other. A good example of that is a landline modem, which nobody really uses anymore, or a TNC might expect to see all the signal pins, right? And you, you grab this, you know, this cheap discount cable and nothing works. And like, okay, well, this sucks. I'll try another cable. And then, sure enough, it works. So just to be something, you know, to be aware of. Um, so I talk about handshaking here a bit, and I covered this a little bit. Without handshaking, uh, when you have a mismatch of speeds between the DTE and DCE, um, you'll lose data. In other words, data just gets, it'll just magically disappear. It just won't go across the pipe uh, or across the cable. Um, this was especially uh, a huge problem when the modem itself you know, could handle a, a speed up to 115,200 baud, but you know, the the telephone line itself couldn't support anything more than 56K. And so there was a mismatch between your modem speed and your DTE baud, right? Um, so I talk about, you know, when the DCE isn't ready for data because the DTE is just sending too much data, it'll deassert the clear to send line temporarily until the modem's got enough time to empty its buffer to be able to accept more data, right? Um, with the data terminal equipment, uh, when when uh, the DTE isn't ready, it'll deassert the RTS or request to send line, right? This doesn't happen too often. Uh, it can happen if, uh, you know, the terminal program isn't running, in which case data terminal ready will also be deasserted. Um, but a good example of that was, you know, when I talked about, you know, teletypes where they weren't able to accept the full speed of the modem. Um, and of course, I talk about, you know, on a PC, uh, data terminal ready uh, will, will be deasserted until you have a, a, a terminal program running, right? Um, that's if you're just using standard terminal software, if you're using amateur radio software, unless you force DTR to be asserted, um, you know, it'll stay low. And of course, one thing we, we used to see a lot with, with uh, modems was that when you turn the modem on for about two seconds or so while the modem was booting, data set ready would take about two seconds or a second or two to come up before it was ready to accept data. Um, so the, there's three different types of flow control that we see within uh, RS-232. Uh, the RTS-CTS method, uh, the Exxon X-Off method. Uh, now the Exxon X-Off method, wax on, wax off, um, control S sends an X-Off signal. Um, and control Q sends an X on signal. Someone figured out that using X on X off as flow control was better than using the hardware CTS RTS. So where we would see X on X off would be with, uh, you know, a, like a modern modem. And then of course, um, we can turn flow control completely off. Um, 
using virtual RS-232 devices and a nice fast computer, um, you know, there really isn't any need to use flow control, right? Um, so uh, nothing bad is going to happen if you just shut it off, right? Uh, where you can end up with a little bit of frustration is if you enable C like RTS, CTS, or hardware flow control, and the device doesn't support it, like a MAX 232 based um, RS-232 to USB adapter that doesn't have those control lines. If you have the hardware handshaking turned on, nothing will happen no matter what you do. So, you know, one of the first things you do troubleshoot, shut off low control or turn on X on X off and then see what happens. And of course, the little picture I got there was from um, Weird Al's UHF. The kid drinks from a fire hose. This is pretty much what happens when you turn it off. Now, if we take a look at the way it looks like on an oscilloscope, um, when a RS-232 line idles, it will always be at uh, the um, negative 12. And then the first start bit happens. Then you get seven or eight data bits, depending on how you configured it. A parity bit, if it's set, a stop bit, and then it'll idle, right? So the start bit tells the uh, DCE or the terminal that it has a bit coming. And, um, you know, a logic zero is called a space and a logic one is called a mark. So if we were to hook this up to an oscilloscope, if we were to hook up one of the receive data and transmit data pins up to an oscilloscope, we see something like this. Um, now, in this example, we see one start bit, seven data bits, one parity bit, and one stop bit, right? Uh, typically, we can select seven bits or eight bits. Uh, it's always one start bit. The parity bit is optional, so it can either be a zero or a one if it's odd or even parity. Uh, and then we can have one, one and a half, or two stop bits, depending on how we configured things. With modern computers, we usually only get the option of one or two stop bits. And the reason for why you'd need two stop bits was back in the days of mechanical teletypes, they needed two stop bits. Now, I'm not going to get too much into what parity is. Basically, the problem with parity is that if you have two bit flips, the parity doesn't mean anything. Um, the idea behind parity is that uh, the bit would be um, a zero or a one, depending on the number of bits that were in your data. Even parity would mean that you'd have an even number of you know, bits that would be a one and an odd number, like an odd parity would be an odd number of bits. So if you had, uh, in this example, we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, right? We have five uh, bits, which are um, plus 12. And so there, therefore the, the, the parity bit is a one. However, um, Again, it's largely useless. And the only thing you really need to know is that if you have the parity bit misconfigured, what will happen is, is you'll either get no data or you're just gonna get a screen full of garbage. So because of its uselessness, we typically don't even use it. So that area I've circled in red would be not there, right? Um, now, one thing I do wanna say is some applications uh, allow you to be able to force the parity bit completely on or completely off. Don't do that because it messes things up. It never goes well and there's no reason for it. So if you were presented with that option, don't use it. Uh, now, I want to talk a bit about duplex. Now, if you hook a, um, if you if you start up your computer and you you know, uh, start putty or something, right? And you connect it up to the cat port on the back of your radio, and then you start typing in commands into your radio, nothing is going to come up on the terminal because the uh, radio, and this is especially true of, of Yesu radios, don't echo, echo your characters back to you, right? Uh, 
So when we talk about full duplex operation, what that means is that when I send something from one DTE to another DTE, in this case, I just use a mainframe slash mini computer as an example, just to differentiate it uh, between a personal computer. Um, it will echo the character back to you and let you know that you typed it in, right? Uh, so in half duplex operation, it just ignores everything you send it. So one option that you get in a terminal is something called local echo, which means that when you type in a character, the DTE on the other side doesn't echo it back to you. You just see it on your terminal anyways, because your computer's picking it up. It's just a way to confirm what you have typed, right? Um, so this is what they mean by uh, local echo. Now, if you have local echo turned on, but the DTE on the other side also supports full duplex. What that means is every single character that you type in will show up twice, right? So if I type in bud, I get BBUUDD. -D. And it's like, oh, I have local echo on, and I should probably shut that off. So uh, this is what we mean by half duplex or full duplex. Now, um, when I talk about troubleshooting stuff, uh, there are RS-232 breakout boxes that you can buy and you can, you know, with a storage oscilloscope, you can snoop the bits to try and find out uh, what is going on with the connection. So you can determine, oh, do I have a bad cable? Do I have a baud rate mismatch? Uh, are, you know, do I get uh, proper pins that are asserted or deasserted? Uh, in this particular case, this uh, UNO uh, breakout tester would show you uh, the, the common control pins, whether or not they're asserted or deasserted. And of course, one thing you can do is if you have no clue uh, what the baud rate is of, you know, whatever it is that you're talking to, if you snoop it with a scope, all that you have to do is just look at the duration of one data bit and then invert it and that will tell you the approximate baud rate of what you should be using. Um, most stuff by default out of the box, 9,600 baud, eight data bits, one stop bit, no parity. That's very, very typical. And that's very, very common for most equipment out there. So if you have no idea what to use, well, try that first, 9,600 and eight one is, is what we, what we talk about. Uh, that little RS-232 check tester on the upper right-hand side, it's 25 pins a piece. And I used to use that one of those a lot in my job. Um, and the red and green uh, LEDs would tell me whether or not it was deasserted or not. And I could easily tell if I had something wrong with a modem or with an RS-232 port with one of those guys. Um, so CAT, right, to troubleshoot it, just to make things interesting, Yesu set these guys up with two stop bits, not one. So if you're ever using it with a program that needs to communicate um, to the radio, make sure you configure it with two stop bits, not one stop bit. I have no idea why Yesu did that. Maybe they just like to annoy hams, I don't know. But um, a lot of CAT radios or CAT capable radios, their transceive speed is at 9,600 baud, but newer radios like the FTDX 2000 and 5000, you can set them to use uh, 38,400 baud. So again, make sure that the transceive speed is set up properly in the radio if you can't communicate to it. Uh, most hams would probably just use the fastest speed, which is the 38,400. Um, and of course, one thing you can also try too is by using PuTTY, I can use something like FA semicolon to get the frequency readout of the first uh, or a VFOA. I was doing that to try and troubleshoot a, a radio with some other guy, uh, some other ham here. And that was the first thing I did as I started up PuTTY. I typed in FA semicolon and it told me the frequency readout of the first VFO. I was like, yep, it's working just fine. There's no problems with the serial port. If it was, if there was an issue, I'd see garbage, right? Um, the other common problem is, is that in the radio settings, you have to enable RTS TX to enable it. So when RTS is asserted, the radio will go into transmit. Um, by default, this is turned off for obvious reasons. So if you find that your 
you're, um, let's say you're running FL Digi or something and it doesn't want to key the radio, uh, you can turn that on. Uh, of course, there's also a cat command you can also use to turn the radio in, or set the radio over into transmit mode too. Again, it's a matter of how you want to set it up. Um, and of course, like anything, make sure that RTS CTS flow control or hardware flow control is turned off. If you have it turned on and you have RTS TX enabled, the radio will key down and it won't let go until you shut it off. Uh, CIV is a little bit more complicated um, in that, uh, depending on the vintage of the radio, um, you know, there is a um, CIV address, right? And the CIV address can be dependent on um, the make, or sorry, the, the model number of the radio. Now, with something like a IC9700, you can set what you want the CIV address to be. But for other radios, uh, those are set with jumpers if it's an older ICOM radio. And of course, uh, as a good example of that, in this chart I've posted here, uh, an IC575 uh, uh, has an address of 16 out of the box. But if you were to buy one at a flea market or something, and you're finding you can't transceive with that address, there's a very real possibility that the ham who had it changed whatever that uh, CIV address was so they could get everything working in their shack and communicating. Um, per the diagram below, you'll notice that there's only really, you know, uh, a few pins that are connected, RXD and TXD, five and four bridged and one is bridged. Um, now, I'm not going to get into what those are, but you can see that the, the connections are quite simple. And then you have a MAX 232, and that's just you know, stereo cables to all your transceivers, so it's pretty straightforward. Um, again, 9600, eight bits, eight data bits, no parity, one stop bit. Check the manual, right? The manual will always usually tell you how to configure CIV. Um, and of course, uh, with a lot of ICOM radios, there is an option to turn CIV transceive off. So if CIV transceive is turned off, well, guess what? You got no, you don't have any communication between your computer. Um, and of course, again, RTS ETS flow control is not used because it's not supported with the MAX 232 chip. Um, so, um, one problem that we have with RS-232 is that because we can only have one device, um, we can only have one program or one application accessing an RS-232 port at one time. Uh, a good example of that is PuTTY. If I open up a session to PuTTY and I open up COM4, well, PuTTY now owns COM4 right? Uh, and so if I have another application, like let's say a logging program, and I open it up, and I tell it to use COM4, logging program will basically say to me, what's COM4? I, I, I can't open this port. Something else must be using it. Uh, and so we would run into this problem numerous times. Um, now, I've also seen it where ham lib libraries get corrupted and that sometimes can, if you reinstall it, it can fix it. Um, sometimes a rogue program can lock open a serial port and the fastest way to fix it is just to reboot it and that resets everything back to where everything should be and everybody's happy. Um, so, to get around the problems of this limitation, I use a piece of software called Virtual Serial Port Driver. And Virtual Serial Port Driver lets me do all kinds of weird and wacky things with COM ports that a ham, if you're running lots of pieces of equipment with RS-232 connections, you can do all kinds of really cool things with it. Um, win for Yesu Suite, Win for ICOM Suite, uh, also allow for multiple serial ports to be accessed all at the same time from different applications. And then COM0COM is kind of like a uh, virtual null modem cable that lets you go from one COM port to another COM port uh, rather than having to use physical cables. Uh, I'm going to touch on that usage in just a bit. 
So a good example of how you would set this up is that, um, let's say for example, uh, WSJTX needs COM11 for cat control and your logging software needs COM21. And so what we do is we use COM0COM to have COM18 go to COM11 and COM20 to go to COM21. And then from there within the uh, win for Yesu suite, we then configure the cat's ports as COM18, COM20. So win for Yesu suite is using COM18 and COM20 that it's dedicated to it. COM0, COM acts as that null modem cable to go to an additional set of serial ports to COM11 and COM21. And then from there, um, the WSJTX and your logging software claim the other serial ports. So COM0, COM does some funky things in the background to get the two ports to talk to each other. And it, yeah, it does sound a little bit roundabout and it can, can get quite complicated, um, but that's pretty much it. Now I cite another example here. I have a GPS disciplined oscillator and its only connection to the outside world, outside of its GPS antenna, is an RS-232 port that needs to go to my computer. Now, I, I have a neat little program on my computer called NMEA Time, not NMEAT Time, as tempting as it is to say that. Uh, first time I saw that, I laughed. But N, NMEA Time reads the GPS data and then synchronizes my, my computer clock to GPS. But then I had a problem, I said, well, my ICOM IC9700 can read that GPS data as well for DSTAR operations so that when I'm chatting with people on DSTAR, I can get my radio to tell them where I am. So how on earth do I get the data from the GPS DO to the ICOM radio while still being able to have my computer time synchronized? Uh, 20 years ago, it would have been impossible. Not anymore when I was talking about virtual serial port, the way I do it is that the GPS DO is connected to a real COM2 on my computer. From there, the, the virtual serial port driver takes the data from COM2 and replicates it to COM9, which is a virtual serial port, and COM6, which is a real serial port. And the COM6, is actually uh, a special data cable. It's called an OPC 2350LU. And all that does is that just converts RS-232 data um, via USB to CIV. So if you think about it, it's a roundabout way to go from uh, CIV to USB, right? Um, and then from there, and MIA time is what claims COM9 and it's set up as a read-only port. So I can send the data from COM2 to COM9 and COM6 at the same time simultaneously and be able to use my GPO, GPS DO as a time source for multiple devices in the shack. If anybody's head is exploded, I sincerely apologize. Um, so just a, a thing to talk about DB25 here. Uh, like I said, it's largely obsolete. Uh, the cable in the upper uh, right-hand corner where you see the female 9-pin to male 25-pin, that's a very common modem cable. And you'll see those still being sold today because many TNCs and older modems still use that female 25-pin connector on the back. And the female 9-pin goes to the male 9-pin on the back of the computer. Um, once again, uh, the rationale for the extra pins were, you know, uh, loop back testing and secondary RS-232 and, uh, you know, local and remote clocks and all these kinds of things that are all useless now. Uh, they've been replaced by either RS-422 or RS-485 uh, or even just USB. So, again, it's just a holdover from an older time when... Uh, when these were common. Uh, any 
1980s era PC, if it has a serial port, will have a 25 pin serial cable on it, or uh, not a serial cable, it's uh, RS-232 connector on it, even though it's not using all those pins. And that's just for compatibility because that was what was common back then. Um, even in some cases, they're not even connected to the connector. So now there's a bit of a gotcha with this. And that is that older computers uh, could either have, um, you know, a SCSI connector, small computer systems interface, or it could be a printer uh, port, right? If they're female, right? How do you tell? You can't tell without taking the cover off the computer and looking at the card. So maybe not really a problem, but if you come across an old computer and you decide to hook it up to a modem and you pick the wrong port and use gender changers, you can blow the modem up if, uh, if uh, it's actually a SCSI card or a printer, printer port. You don't want to do that. Um, when we talk about RS-232 underneath Windows, the thing, there's no standard that Windows uses to determine what the name of a serial port is. Now, it used to be back in ye old days that COM1 through to COM4 were always physical serial ports, right? Anything higher than that is always a virtual serial port. In this particular situation, with my own computer, you can see that there's all kinds of devices that all have unique names. Um, like for example, the COM1 and COM2 that you see here, that's actually a physically installed card that's in my machine right now. And they call it PCIe to high speed serial port. Uh, but my IC9700 shows up as Silicon Lab CP210 USB to UR bridge. And I'm just saying, what the heck is a UART? Uh, UART is basically the chip that makes all the serial stuff happen. Um, to kind of put things in a nutshell, universal asynchronous receiver transmitter. Okay, so that's the chip that creates all the RS-232 loveliness. Um, so, you know, I have, a, I have a flex control USB knob. Okay, fine, whatever. And it's COM10. It's not a real serial a serial port device. It's just something it detects as that. So anyway, uh, generally though, if you don't know what you're looking for in the device manager and you see something that says you are, typically it's some sort of serial port. Um, now, Linux is a bit different in that um, the way they did it with Linux is that they call a serial port TTY. Why? Because it's short for teletype. Because, well, when Unix was developed, guess what? They used teletypes. So a serial port was a teletype. So if we take a look in the D message, which is the uh, kernel readout, not to bore everyone half to death here, if you're searching for certain texts like serial, FTDI, TTYS, or TTY USB, you'll generally find either real serial ports or virtual serial ports, uh, depending on what you're looking for. Uh, USB to RS-232 converters will always usually show up as TTY. USB physical serial ports always show up as TTYS, right? Um, the set serial command can be used to uh, define how you want to set up a serial port and can detect them and can let you know what on earth they are. And I just prefer using something called Minicom uh, as the terminal program of choice for underneath Linux for anything uh, dumb terminal related. Um, because it's just so easy to use. And it reminds me a lot of Telex, which is something I used back in the 80s, 90s for very lengthy periods of time. Now, uh, for a lot of you, you might think this is completely irrelevant. If you were, if you want like a period correct computer in the shack, right? Uh, COM1, COM2, COM3, COM4, believe it or not, they only use two interrupts. So uh, between um, COM1 and COM2, they shared one interrupt. Between COM3 and COM4, they shared one interrupt, uh, if my memory serves me right. And so we would only either use COM1 or COM2 or COM3 or COM4, but never 
you know, um, did I mess this up? So let me think for a second. Use interrupt four, COM2 uses, COM2, COM4 uses interrupt three. Yeah, so you'd either use, um, you know, COM1, COM3, or COM2, COM4, uh, but, you know, um, I think I made a mistake in my, on my slide here. Um, basically, you can only use one at a time if you're, if you're sharing interrupts, right? Um, if you try to use the same interrupt twice, you get unpredictable operation. All I really have to say is that modern operating systems don't have this problem and nobody really cares, but it's just something to keep in mind if you're using an old computer that there is that interrupt sharing and it can cause you grief if you are using something like that. And the only other thing I just thought I might wanna mention is that older UARTs don't really support anything more than 9,600 bit per second or 9600 baud, same thing, unless you're using a modem. We can get into that discussion later. Um, so again, the tips and tricks, you know, write with pen on the connector where it goes to. So, you know, write out number one, number two, if you're connecting it to the back of the computer, so that if you do have to disconnect them, you don't mix them up. Uh, don't over tighten the screws on the, on the connector right? Because if you over tighten them, those little bolts at the top and the top picture, they will come off the either side of the connector and they're a pain to put back to, you know, to put back on. And it also makes the connector more difficult to take off. So just finger tighten them. Don't use a screwdriver, right? Uh, keep a supply of those seven millimeter by five uh, screws handy. You don't need a huge supply of them, just a few of them in case you accidentally do take one of those little screws off. Um, I find I still like to keep a little supply of those things around because sometimes they do come off. Um, ideally, you do want to use a seven millimeter socket screwdriver to put them back on. Uh, but if you're in a pinch and you can't find one, using a pair of needle nose pliers will work in a pinch if you absolutely have to. Uh, to get them off, but I wouldn't reuse them because it messes up the threads inside of the screw and you don't want to deal with that. Um, if the connector doesn't want to go in, just check for bent pins, right? Very common thing, you're, you know, dark at night, you're putting the connector in sideways and you're jamming it in there and you bend a pin. Why well, won't this thing go in? And you get out your camera and take a look and, ah, I bent a pin. You just get a little you know, jeweler, screwdriver, or needle nose pliers and straighten out those pins. Um, and then from there, like I kind of cite an example here of a connector below that's missing those screws on either side. And that's where that can come in handy. And of course I say label or discard partially wired cables. If you're in doubt, get a get an ohmmeter, test each pin. Um, and either if it's partially wired, um, just make sure that you're aware of it, label it or throw it out and get a, a fully wired one. Again, my, my go-to supplier for RS-232 cables is Circamax because they do them right the first time and they properly wire them right from the get-go. They are a little bit more expensive, but uh, I've never had a problem with them. Um, now, if you want to go beyond two RS-232 connectors, uh, you can get something called a terminal server. And a terminal server uh, will allow you to have multiple RS-232 devices to ethernet. From there, the way you access it is that you literally can just use telnet to the IP address and then a port number of the device. So you can have as many as you want over ethernet. And this comes in incredibly handy if you need to run long distances of cable, or if you have, you know, lots of these ports and you don't want to have an add-on card to your computer or whatever. Um, back in ye old days in the 1990s, uh, in CAD Vision times, when I worked for them, I had 4,300 of these ports uh, connected up to Ethernet. Uh, one of the largest modem pools in North America. Um, and... Um, if you notice very carefully, uh, if you haven't noticed by now, if it's a terminal server, how come all the pins are male? They should all be female. But 
Uh, in this particular case, they made them all male, which means that they may be DCE, they may be DTE. You won't know until you get out a tester and find out, right? Or until you start playing around with null modem cables and straight through cables and, and find out what works and doesn't work. Or if you just read the manual, the manual tells you how they're all they're wired up, but they should all be female, not male. Now, I just wanted to just touch on this very briefly because some of us may go to a flea market or something and find one of these ancient old things called a TNC, right? Uh, PK232, uh, PK232 MBX, one of my favorite ones. Uh, again, in ye old days, we would have our IBM AT computer connected up to our terminal node controller. And then the terminal controller would do all the heavy lifting. So we do all the signal processing and all the modeming that it does. That's even a verb. And then from there, we would have our custom made cables that would go from the back of the TNC to the radio. We would need RS-232 to go for the, between the TNC and the, and the computer. And we would need another cable for the cat control. Right. So as you can understand, that starts getting a little bit complicated. The new way we would do it is just use a sound card interface and let the computer do all the heavy lifting. And we still need RS-232 because we need to be able to tell, um, you know, the radio when we want it to key up or what frequent we need to read out what's frequency it's on or whatever. Um, but the upside is, is that these old TNC, since they had all the processing power on board, all we really needed was just a dumb terminal. We didn't need anything more than that. It, we just needed a text interface. 